let's talk about markets. I know equities are everyone's favorite topic. And we all, we both agree that the multiples look extended, especially with these higher rates. And um, so what are your thoughts when you look at the market and what you're seeing across the different sectors and what's seeming to be more attractive to you versus less attractive? Well, the, we, we really have two markets. Uh, we have big cap tech as one market and the other market is everything else. <laughs> uh, if you look at the Russell 2000 this week, uh, before a, a bounce, uh, it closed at its lowest level in about three years. While the big cap tech stocks are, while they're off their highs, are relatively near their highs. So it's a very bifurcated situation. Uh, you have growthy stuff still well outperforming value stocks. So it really depends on where you look in terms of defining the market. And the question is whether those big cap tech stocks uh, or masking a, a large amount of underlying weakness that will eventually catch up to those big names, or at some point that weakness catches up and rebounds and, and starts to trade well because of the large cap stocks trading well. I think it'll be the, the, the former rather than the latter, uh, because when you think about these big cap tech stocks like Microsoft and Google and Meta, how great they are and how fortress, fortress balance sheets that they have their customers are still small and medium-sized businesses, many of which. Obviously, they have large customers too, but uh, their, their business is still predicated on the health of the overall economy. They don't breathe separate economic air. They breathe the same economic air as the rest of us. Well said. Absolutely. And smaller businesses are definitely more sensitive to these rate hikes and these higher costs. So it could definitely impact those big, I guess they call the big seven, I don't know, magnificent seven, whatever they are. Um, but yes, like you said, it's a bifurcated market. You have those big tech and then you have everything else. So let's talk about the everything else. And I, I particularly have a fondness for the international markets, emerging markets and other countries. Are there any ones in particular that you like that you're looking at? So I'm I'm very bullish on uh, emerging Asian uh, mm -hmm. markets uh, like Singapore and Vietnam. Uh, Indonesia is attractive. I'm even bullish on the developed market of Japan, which mm -hmm. uh, were long stocks there. Uh, India is a very exciting story, yes. and even with China, you know, China with all of its challenges, with all of its its battles with the U.S., there is a, a, a middle class that's going to grow sharply there. Uh, I've seen stats that I um, can't remember who the company was, uh, but I've seen other stats too, that the size of the Chinese middle class is going to go from 400 million people to 700 million people over the next five years. So the, this growing middle class, this growing wealth in Asia makes it a very exciting uh, emerging market story. And you're talking about stock markets that have dramatically underperformed uh, U.S. markets over the past 10, 15 years. So that's exciting. And not just on the equity side, but also on the bond side. Uh, we like emerging market local currency bonds, particularly in Asia, that uh, I think you will get the benefit of an eventual uh, weakness in the dollar relative to these countries, in addition to some pretty good yields right now. Agree. I'm also looking over there. You know, I've been doing some research about China and yeah, they're they're they've been going for quite some time into more of a service economy and they've been shifting. So there's a rise in that middle class that's forming. And so they're going to be wanting and needing services and just basic services that that we take for granted here in the United States, but it's growing over there. So definitely lots of opportunities within the big country of China. Uh, actually had someone recently on, a, an old friend, but he's a filmmaker and he was talking about China and how the, the movie theaters, I know there's a, lot, there's a lot of censorship, but they're growing. It's like growing significantly. People are getting excited to be able to go out to the movie theater. Well, we've had that since the beginning of time here in the States, but these little uh, luxuries, I guess you call it, are, are just uh, are just starting to really open up over there. So it's very fascinating stuff to uh, to learn about. So thanks for that. Um, yeah, I mean, domestic travel in China 
uh, is above the its 2019 levels. It's it's the international mm -hmm. side that has a lot of catch up, uh, but it's going to catch up. The, the Chinese tourist spent 250 billion dollars uh, in 2019 outside of China, uh, and we're not yet close to that number. So there there is a lot of catch up, and that Chinese tourist uh, is going to be out there and spending in the coming years as they uh, try to revert back to their pre-COVID lives again. Absolutely. Well said. The travel and leisure section um, sector over there. Absolutely. Um, there's just a lot of that going on. So we definitely something to watch. Um, you know, besides international markets and emerging markets, um, the asset classes, let's talk about gold. Everyone's talking about gold. It's been talked about. And this was the flight to, you know, in stagflationary times back in the 70s and 80s. Um, what are your thoughts on gold? Do you think it's going to go past 2000? And some people are even saying like, you know, 4000 and higher. Um, what are your thoughts? Are you bullish on gold? I am bullish on gold. I, I've been bullish on gold for a while. This is nothing new for me. Uh, I think that um, gold is going much higher. Uh, I think gold has put in a, a stellar performance over the past um, year and a half plus since the beginning of 2022 in the face of uh, the fastest rise in interest rates in generations and the the, the in a very strong dollar. Uh, so to be able to trade as well as it has in the face of that, I think says a lot about its natural underlying demand with a lot of that coming from the world's central banks. And that certainly was facilitated too by what the EU and the US did after Russia invaded Ukraine, where we basically froze half of Russia's central bank reserves. Uh, it made owning gold for any central bank that much more attractive because no one was going to confiscate your gold holdings. Uh, and, and that central bank buying continues on. So I, I expect much higher prices in gold. I think once the Fed is formally done raising interest rates, uh, I think that that will end up being a boost. I think the, the, the U.S. exploiting debts and deficits is going to matter for the dollar negatively at some point. And even with the recent dollar rally, it's still well below its Octo October 2022 peak, recent peak. I mean, the dollar strength has really proven to be just strictly an interest rate slash central bank differential thing. Uh, it hasn't really been much more. And uh, uh, I, I'm very bullish on metals. I'm also bullish on other commodities like energy, oil and gas stocks, uranium, uh, copper. And um, I think commodities are, uh, while they're certainly going to be impacted by the vagaries of the economy, uh, I do think that there's an underlying supply challenge for many of these that uh, are going to lead to higher prices. I mean, we've seen even this year and, and last year, the safety trade has been gold and energy stocks and short-term treasuries. Uh, that's been the safety trade, and I, I can expect that to continue. Agree completely. I've been speaking. I've been really uh, bullish on commodities and believe we're in a secular bull market for commodities. And there's a high demand of real assets. Um, so yeah, oil, energy, uh, uranium, agree. Energy is the key. We, we need energy to survive. Um, and then, you know, another one of interest is lithium. Um, I find that interesting as well. Uh, very volatile, but uh, interesting. Now, what's this correlation? You know, usually we always we always study in economics, um, you know, commodities and the dollar are inversely related, right? Well, we have the dollar up, we have rates up, obviously they work together and gold up as well. So what's going on? Do you think one of them is going to turn another way or what? Well, that, that, that's been the, the most interesting thing here is we've seen this dramatic rise in real rates at the same time as we've seen a rise in gold. If you look back over the last two years before. So, so when the Fed started raising interest rates, you look at the real five-year yield. Mm -hmm. It's gone from minus 200 basis points to plus 200 basis point, 250 basis points today. And in the face of that dramatic move, gold is still up. So like I yes. said, it tells you that there's this, this large underlying bid for physical gold that is keeping prices where they are and having a trade as well as it is, and just the stones throw from record highs. 
Absolutely agree. Now with your gold, are you, I actually did a tweet about this because there's a lot of discussion about ways to buy gold. Are you one that's bullish on the physical asset of gold? Do you like the ETFs, the futures, um, the miners? How do you like to have your gold? So for clients, we own a combination of uh, physically backed ETFs like PHYS for gold, for example. Uh, and we do own some miners, both ETF, through ETFs and also individual companies. So I think it's good to have a combination. Mm -hmm. We tilt more to the physical just because the mining business is so difficult and mining stocks for the last few decades have been so disappointing uh, relative to the price of, of, of the underlying gold and silver price. Uh, now, at some point that will change and, and uh, gold miners will get appreciation from the markets again particularly when gold miners today can sell gold for $1,950 an ounce uh, after this recent rally and uh, their margins are going to expand even further. Uh, I think people at some point will wake up to the, the profitability, the outsized profitability of this sector uh, in this up cycle. But uh, I still think it's good to own physical where you don't have to deal with uh, the, the, the terrible mining business that it is. <laughs> Exactly. And there's margins compressed with all these businesses as well as the miners. Um, so absolutely. And diversification is key. Like you said, have a, a mix of different things. And there's an ETF for everything nowadays, right? I think you can you can buy almost anything through ETFs. And I like that. It's a great liquid vehicles. And that's that's key. It's liquidity um, is always very important. So uh, well said, Peter. Thank you so much. Yeah, and like you said that going international, there's a lot of stagnation that's going on. We know in Europe, in the Eurozone, there's stagflation in many of the different countries there. And uh, U.S. is headed for, who knows, definitely a recession, um, but a lot of stagnation. So these international markets are probably going to have, in my opinion, the most growth uh, going forward in the next few years. Yeah, and people have to keep in mind when you look at, let's just take Europe, for example. Yeah. Um, you look at the, the the FTSE 100 in the UK. A lot of that index is commodity based. It's BHP, it's Shell, it's BP. So that market sort of trades off where the pound is going and where these commodities go. If you look at the French CAC, uh, they're heavily influenced by fashion uh, companies mm -hmm. like LVMH, uh, Carrick, for example, that owns Gucci. Uh, if you look at Germany, Germany is is, is very industrial and manufacturing based. Uh, so Siemens, for example, BMW, Mercedes, you know, these are all global companies that have the same geographic exposure that Toyota might in Japan or Ford and GM may have in, in the U.S. So it's, it's important when you invest internationally to understand that there are always opportunities in these international uh, markets to find, but for whatever reason, uh, stocks that trade outside the U.S. tend to trade at a, a cheaper multiple than in the U.S., even if they're their same line of business, even if they have uh, similar uh, sort of breakdowns in terms of uh, geographies and where they sell to. You are a wealth of information, Peter. Respect you so much. Thank you so much for sharing that. Such an excellent point. You have to always look under the hood and always look at those multiples. You know, you can get greater value um, outside of the States. I think it's everyone just, the U.S. equities are just so sexy. I guess the New York Stock Exchange, everyone goes crazy for it. And the multiples are so extended. So absolutely well said. Thank you so much. Now, I want to talk about the digital gold, Bitcoin. What are your thoughts on digital assets and mainly Bitcoin? It's been holding firm. It's been going up. I think it hit like 35,000 overnight. It's in that high range of 33, 34. It's definitely uncorrelated and broken away um, from the markets. Could be a global reserve asset. Your thoughts? Uh, well, I, I sympathize with uh, Bitcoin bulls because they're bullish on Bitcoin for the same reasons that I'm bullish on gold and silver. Uh, you're talking about uh, uh, an asset where uh, the growth of it in terms of quantity is very slow. Obviously, there's a limit to Bitcoin, but there's mm -hmm. still a growth of about 1% to 2%, similar to uh, the production growth rate for gold. Uh, so it is a scarce asset that can't be printed by a central bank. Mm -hmm. uh, so I understand why people own Bitcoin. I'd rather express it through gold. 
Bitcoin is certainly getting a lift here from uh, the prospect, the growing likely to, uh, the prospect of ETFs that will own Bitcoin. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll power to those that are bullish. Uh, I don't really care for it to, to hold as an asset. Uh, again, I can express my 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 macro views through other things rather than than Bitcoin. Um, certainly, that has not been to my benefit when it was you know in, in pennies uh, 15 years ago. But it is what it is, and uh, I just think people should have eyes wide open. But it's definitely benefiting from the ETFs that will have to own it, and uh, it'll be a great trading vehicle for people. Absolutely. Well said. Thank you. Now you said silver too. So I want to go into silver. We talked about gold. How bullish are you to silver compared to gold? Do you think it may be able to run more, have potential for more growth, or is gold just the standard? Well, gold certainly is, but silver is a, a very unique asset as well. And uh, if this gold bull market really gets its legs Silver is going to even run even faster, mm -hmm. leverage play on gold. But silver is interesting because half the demand for silver is industrial uses. Mm -hmm. And one of the main drivers right now for silver in an industrial use is solar panels. And the world is is going a renewable, as we know, and a lot of solar farms are getting built and each panel needs some silver. Uh, then you also have obviously jewelry demand, uh, tableware demand, then, then investment demand. Uh, but silver is unique and um, it's down 50% from its highs. And uh, I find it extremely attractive and expect it to uh, not only test, but exceed at some point. It's, it's, it's record highs that we saw in 1980 and we saw again in 2011. Absolutely. Definitely.